This is Inspiring Careers with your host, Ingrid Centurion. We're gonna talk about fascinating technologies that will impact your future. Meet inspiring entrepreneurs and people that are making huge differences in the community and around the world. We're gonna share career and life lessons of inspiration and success. Our mission is to inspire our viewers to make a better life for themselves by sharing our stories, our interviews, and documentaries. Please stay tuned as we have incredible guests coming up. We have the honor of having Lee Goldberg with us. Lee served in Vietnam as a signal officer and he's going to be sharing with us some great stories. His first job back from Vietnam was working for John Quincy Adams in the bond and stock department at John Hancock Insurance. He then ran a venture portfolio and then became the senior loan officer, providing loans to Campgrounds of America and Essence Magazine. After six years, he wanted to do something else, and so he started the Turnaround Management Association. Today, he is fully dedicated to Veteran. Veteran is an organization he created to support veteran-owned businesses. Thank you, Lee, for being on the show with us today. Welcome to be here. So where do we start? You told me at one time you wanted to be a rabbi, then you wanted to be the president of the United States. Right. So you definitely have aimed high throughout right. <laughs> your entire life. And where do we start? Uh, at 19, what did you want to be? At uh, 19, I wanted to be president of the United States because um, I just had these ambitions that I, I wanted to do something that was important and significant and uh, I thought that would be a pretty good job. <laughs> um, but I was also an ROTC in college, so um, I, I finished that obligation by going to the military. And um, as it turns out, um, I went in as an officer and uh, got my orders to Vietnam. In, uh, I think it was like March of 1967. And I went over to Vietnam in June of 67, and um, uh, that kind of changed my life. Because I, uh, during that during that period from '67 to '68, I um, became involved with the Tet Offensive in January of '68 through June of '68. And we've got some pictures here of of you when you were there. So there, I started out. My first job in Vietnam was as a platoon leader for a uh, signal company uh, in Tui Hoa, Vietnam. And that picture was taken in Tui Hoa. You, you, you can see it's all sand, and they have they have wooden boards that you walk on. Um, so that's always my first job. And then, um, then I was asked to come down and take on the position of the assistant S4 for the battalion, which is the logistics officer, because the battalion command, the battalion uh, logistics officer, who's a captain, was rotating back. And um, so I did that. And um, so that was probably in December of 67. And in January of 68, um, the S4 had rotated back, and I'm now the S4 of the battalion. And my battalion commander said to me, um, Lee, get your stuff together. You and I and the sergeant major are leaving. And I said, this was in the Trang, Vietnam. Uh, I said, is, oh, this is this picture right here, Well, right? this is in Fuba, yeah. So okay, I, he Fubai. said, we're leaving. I said, where are we going? He said, I can't tell you. And we landed in a place called Fubai. And um, Fubai was in the I Corps, which is the northern sector of Vietnam. And I didn't know it at the time. But uh, Mac V Forward was being set up, which was the Military Assistance Command for Vietnam. Uh, had, it was under uh, William S. Westmoreland, and General Creighton Abrams, who was the number two in command, uh, set up MACV forward. Um, 10,000 North Vietnamese had attacked the city of Hue, which was the ancient capital of Vietnam. And the 1st Marine Division, the 3rd Marine Division, had moved up from Phu Bai to Hue. Uh, and uh, the 101st Airborne, the 1st Air Cab, and a whole bunch of Army units came in to Phu Bai. And so my job was to provide logistic support for that whole operation from January through, uh, through the end of the Tet Offensive, which ended sometime in March. So that was kind of crazy. And you had a lot of leadership positions in Vietnam. Well, I had, I had a lot of different jobs. Um, one of my responsibilities was to take Marine convoys back and forth from Phu Bai to Da Nang mm -hmm. to, to, get, to resupply logistics. So I had responsibility for, for uh, probably about 12 to 14 vehicles that were under, uh, were under our command. And um, uh, when the troops were taken out of Quezon, uh, they all came back into our cantonment area. And my battalion commander asked me to take one of them who had a nervous breakdown in Quezon. Quezon, by the way, 
people don't know it, it was basically a hole in the ground surrounded by the Vietnamese. And um, uh, it was basically at the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and West Marlin thought it was important to keep as a strategic piece of ground that they wanted to control because it was at the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But these people were living like animals on the ground for six months. They had no, very little food. They couldn't shower. They basically had nothing. So when they came in, I remember walking into my cantonment area and seeing this pile of clothing in the middle of the cantonment area with these guys in the showers. And one of the guys had a nervous breakdown. Um, my battalion commander asked me to bring him down to Da Nang on, on the next convoy uh, to bring him out to a hospital ship uh, so he could get help. So I ended up doing that and um, brought him out to this hospital ship and ended up staying on the hospital ship for 24 hours because the hospital ship went out to sea to get refueled. And that's really, really where I saw a lot of these um, soldiers who were being brought in by helicopter to the hospital ship to be taken care of. Um, it was kind of, it was kind of uh, an amazing vision of seeing these people at the same time being on a hospital ship with these American nurses in white uniforms <laughs> and being an officer, you know, uh, having dinner with them in the mess hall. Uh, but yeah, I had responsibility for convoys. I had responsibility for logistics. I used to fly around in Huey helicopters up to the DMZ um, to check on all the troops. Um, it was a 24-7 uh, job, basically. And you, you know, at night you get mortared, and uh, you just don't know uh, what's going to happen next. So it's um, it's something that uh, that I'll never forget. So for a while, you were uh, providing defense counsel to some enlisted soldiers. Yes. And you did a lot of research. You were the resident lawyer. Share with us some stories on, on how successful well, so you before, were there. Before, we, before I got my orders to go to, not my orders, before the battalion commander asked me to go with him to Fubai, um, we were in the Trang, and I was the S4 of the battalion. And um, so one of the soldiers who had been brought up on charges, I think it was possession of marijuana, asked me if I would defend him because he was being court martial. Um, and so I did, and um, uh, and I did my research, and I found out that there had to be, a, in order for them him to be convicted, they had to show that the marijuana they had taken from him was actually the one, the same marijuana that was tested in Japan, and that's, that's the same marijuana that they're bringing him charges for for, uh, for possessing. And uh, so I, I basically defended him, and uh, they couldn't prove that the trail existed, so he got off, and. Um, uh, and then at that point, I had four or five other soldiers come to me to ask me if I would defend them, and they all had all they were all brought up on different charges, but they were all court-martialed, uh, and I, I won all those cases. So um, <laughs> the uh, the brigade commander was not very happy uh, since I was a battalion staff officer and uh, asked me to come down to brigade and uh, read me a letter of reprimand, uh, basically telling me I couldn't do that anymore, and then he tore it up. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I enjoyed that actually. Now, um, you went on, after you came back from Vietnam, you had your first job in an interview. Right. Can you share with us your experience on that interview? Because yeah, so when you got back, you got married, you had your family. Well, I had been married before I left for Vietnam. I had actually met my wife uh, bef you know, when I was in college. Uh, and I met her in Hawaii, in R&R, &R, before, before I got my uh, transfer to Fubai. Uh, but um, before I get to the story of how I got hired, it's important to know that when I, Vietnam changed me. And um, when I came back, first I kissed the ground when I landed back in the States, because people, unless you have been in third, third world countries, you don't appreciate what life is like here in the United States. Um, you have a sense of urgency about things. There are lives at stake. Um, they may not be shooting real bullets at you, but, um, but there are people out there who, um, who do things that uh, are not necessarily in your best interest, and so you've got to be aware that lives could be jobs, there are jobs at stake. Um, and uh, so I felt as though um, when, I, when I came back, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something important. Uh, because I felt as though I had a responsibility now to take back what I what I learned, and my sense of urgency, um, and um, and help others. But um, when I came back, look, in 1968 there was no support for Vietnam veterans returning. None of my friends went. There was no network. There were no resources I could look to. So I went to the library and I looked up names of companies. 
Um, and I sent out letters, I typed up a letter uh, on a typewriter, uh, which they don't have anymore. <laughs> and uh, I typed up letters and I mimeographed a resume, which they don't do anymore. And I sent it out to, I don't know, a hundred or so companies. And I got a response back, a letter back from a gentleman by the name of John Quincy Adams, who was a direct descendant of the president, uh, John Quincy Adams, and um, was the senior vice president of the bond and stock department of John Hancock Insurance Company. And he asked me to come in for an interview. And so I did, I went in for an interview and uh, without checking any references at all, uh, at some point during the interview he said to me, uh, Lee, I'd like to hire you. I said, okay. <laughs> he said, do you wanna work in bonds or stocks? And I said, I don't know, stocks. He says, okay, I'm gonna put you in bonds. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up running a venture capital portfolio, I ended up running a large portfolio of loans to the forest products, pulp and paper, home furnishing, textiles industries. I had an incredible uh, experience for about a six year period. Um, there's now a, a very successful black women's magazine called Essence Magazine and I made that first loan to them. There's a large uh, chain of, camp, of campgrounds called Campgrounds of America, KOA. Uh, it's the largest franchise campground chain in the country, I did that deal. Um, I was involved with uh, paper companies in U.S. and Canada, so I did a lot of traveling in Canada as well. Uh, it was just a tremendous experience. But I learned about, I didn't know why he hired me at the time, and I didn't learn that until about six years ago, um, when uh, a gentleman by the name of Roger Nastow, who he hired a year after he hired me, he was also a Vietnam vet, told me the following story, that when John Quincy Adams was going to Harvard, in the 1940s, it was during the Second World War. Uh, he dropped out uh, to go into the military. He was flying bombers in Europe and got shot down and um, came back and paid his respects to his best friend's dad. His best friend got killed and uh, his best friend's father's name was Tim Clark, who was chairman of John Hancock. And Tim Clark said to him, JQ, um, when you come back, I know you're gonna finish up at Harvard, but I want you to know there's always a job here for you with John Hancock. And that's what happened, he finished up, um, went to work at John Hancock, became one of the more senior people at the, at the, at the insurance company, uh, in charge of the bond and stock department, and I was the first veteran that he hired. That's why he hired me. So when I heard that story, I had had a pretty successful career. I'd been involved with hundreds of companies and I'd been CEO of about 14 companies in my career. Um, I had to give back, and so I ended up starting veteran uh, which is basically a, um, a nonprofit that provides training for veteran small business owners free of charge to help them grow their businesses. So um, I'm pretty proud of that. Today, you all think of Honest Abe as a noble nickname, but it started because I'm brutally honest. And so I'm going to be brutally honest with you. You're spending money like a bunch of putzes. You hear me? $12 burritos, $15 cocktails. The heck are you thinking? If I had arms, wasn't two-dimensional, and didn't die over a century ago, I'd give you my patented stovepipe pile driver. How'd you like that? The choice is yours. Start saving or receive a figurative chin beard body slam from Honest Abe. And after you left John Quincy, you also did some work and started an organization called the Turnaround Management Association. Right. So I, I, so I, I didn't actually start the national organization. That, that's a kind of an interesting story. Um, yes. There's a gentleman uh, who did some research work, I think at the University of North Carolina, on professionals who do turnaround management consulting, which is working with underperforming businesses to help turn them around and restructure them. At the time, I was a partner at Coopers & Library in Boston in charge of the business restructuring group for New England. And um, so he came to me um, and asked me if Coopers & Library would be a, um, an initial sponsor for the organization, um, which, we, which we agreed to do. And as a result of that, they were setting up local chapters around the country because of the national chapters in Chicago. Um, so I helped set up the Northeast chapter. Uh, at the time it was about, I don't know, I think we started out with about 25 people. And I expanded it to include bankers and, la and uh, lawyers and asset-based lenders and consultants and, and basically people from the, every aspect of the pro professional community. And um, 
was president of the organization for a couple of years, um, brought in directors from all those different um, professionals um, and, and resources. And uh, that so TMA today is an international organization. I think they have over 8,000 members around the world. And the Boston chapter, or the Northeast chapter, has about 550 members. And I think we're the third largest chapter in the country. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of that as well. And you have a lot of experiences taking a company that was almost failing and being able to clearly turn that into a profitable organization. Yeah, so most of my career has been spent working as a turnaround consultant, which basically means either as an interim CEO of a company or just going in on a, you know, a short-term basis to come up with a plan to reorganize the business and then either recommending the reorganization plan or actually undertaking the reorganization plan. So I've been involved with hundreds of companies and um, as I said, I've been president or CEO of about 14 companies, but that's been my career. And a lot of that, frankly, uh, came about as a result of my experience in Vietnam because it's all about a sense of urgency. It's all about understanding that there are jobs at stake, understanding that you know, people can lose their jobs unless you actually put in place a plan that will allow the company to be successful and profitable. And frankly, I don't think you know, I, don't think I could have done any of that work if it hadn't been for my experience in the military. And starting veteran, um, how many years ago did you start veteran Except now? 2014. 2014. And now you're a hundred percent full time focused on yeah. Veterans. So I yeah I've, so I've recently retired from my from my regular work, and um, uh, we just finished our third cohort of veteran, and um, we have a partnership with a large nonprofit called Interise. Interise teaches a program called the Streetwise MBA program, uh, on behalf of the SBA in seventy cities around the country. It's called the Emerging Leaders Program, and my partnership. Um, is one where I teach the Streetwise MBA program to veteran cohorts only, just veterans. It could be family members or spouses, but it's basically veterans. Um, and the program is all about they're putting together three-year growth plans to grow their business. So um, we've got some great success stories. I'm really proud of it, and um, uh, so I'm yeah I'm really happy about. So it. you're continuing to do what you've always done: come in, turn around an organization, have a sense of urgency. Share with us some great stories of some businesses that have gone through your program and have been extremely successful uh, over the last five years. In terms of the veteran program? Yes. So one story that I'm really proud of is uh, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Harris, who's got a company called LDP Solutions. Uh, Jeff um, was a Marine, was in Afghanistan, came back. Uh, he was working for a video production company down in uh, Florida in Orlando uh, for Universal Studios. And uh, married a woman from Mansfield, Massachusetts. Came back up here, bought a house. The house had asbestos. Uh, didn't have any money to go out and hire somebody to clean it, so he learned all about d doing the remediation himself. Uh, decided that uh, now that he knew the regulations on in environmental remediation, he would basically do that as a job. Uh, came into my program. Uh, one of the things I failed to mention is everybody who comes into my program gets a mentor and access to our professional resources. Because one of the things that they just don't have is they don't have access to professionals who can help them with resources to grow their business. So as his mentor, I got him a gentleman who was president of a uh, national environmental remediation company called GZA. And um, they kind of hit it off. And they started using him on local assignments. And they got the assignment to do the environmental remediation and the cleanup for the um, Wynn Resort and Casino in Everett, Massachusetts. And he, so he ended up doing that work. Uh, and he's now grown his business pretty successfully and uh, he's added a bunch of people. And um, yeah, so I'm pretty proud of, uh, of Jeff in terms of what he's done. So that's just one example. And now what are you looking for to grow veteran? What are your main priorities this year? So now, so now that I have a little time and now that I have um, three cohorts under my belt, and, and um, uh, by the way, I also received an award from the SBA District Director uh, for my work with the veterans, called the SBA District Director Regional Directors Award, uh, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, I'd like to grow the program. I'd like to take it national. Um, the SBA in Washington, D.C. Uh, is very much interested in supporting the program. I'm working with the um, Veteran Business Outreach Center here in New England, called, called the New England VBOC 
gentleman's name is Brian LaFauci, uh, and there are 20 V-Box around the country. So the idea is to go to each one of these areas in the, around the country and um, work with the VBOC, work with Interise, which teaches the program nationally, and work with the Turnaround Management Association, which has, op which has operations all over the country as well, um, to replicate what I'm doing here in Massachusetts. When is your next course going to start? September of 2018 is my plan. And how many seats are in each class? Twelve seats in each class. How many do you have currently filled? Uh, I've got two or three so far for the for the September class. I'm just now going out and trying to fill those. So you're so I'm looking, looking I'm for looking. veterans who have a business that are interested in attending right. this 13-week course. Right. How many women have attended your course? Two. Two, of which you're, of which you're one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we're really looking for women veterans out there who have a business and want to be a part of this here in Massachusetts. Right. Um, I've also been asked, when are you going to be able to replicate this in other states already? Uh, we have people who want to come to your course, but they're in other states. Yeah, so I, I get people, look, I get, I get people coming to my veteran website all the time. By the way, the website is veteran.org, V-E-T-R-N.org. Um, and if they're in another state, I refer them to the SBA in Washington, D.C., who will refer them to one of, the, um, one of the veteran business outreach centers in other parts of the country. Um, but uh, in, in VBOC here in New England, we'll send people who go through their program to my program. So their program is all about working with transitioning veterans and veterans who want to start a business. And once they go through their program, they then can come into our program. You shared something with me about how the veteran program in general, this is, you're, you're really passionate about this because it's like you're back in the military again. <laughs> and you, you're, you're helping, you're planning, you're doing all those things that you did in Vietnam. So Share it's, with us. Yeah, so it's like, so what I, what, I say to the, what I say to the veterans who apply to the program is, look, unless you have the passion, the commitment, dedication, and perseverance to be successful, you're not gonna be successful. And those are the same qualities that you have when you're in, a, when you're in, a, in, a, in an environment where you're, again, working against host hostile forces. I mean, unless you have dedication, commitment, perseverance, and it's 24-7, and you don't have time to worry about, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen, you just, you just undertake it and you do it, um, you're not going to be successful. And um, so I hope I bring that passion to my classroom. Uh, I'll just give you one example of something that happened this year in this class. So the class starts at 9 o'clock. It's at Dean College in Franklin, Mass. And I was noticing that some of the uh, some of the participants were coming in late. And when I say the class starts at nine o'clock, it starts at nine o'clock. So I said to them, "Let me tell you a story." So I had taken a convoy from Phu Bai down to Da Nang, and the convoy was this is a Marine convoy. Convoy was leaving at ten o'clock a.m. sharp, and I had twelve vehicles out of there. Must have been about thirty vehicles in the convoy, and those vehicles were my responsibility. And I had 12 vehicles and 11 drivers. And I couldn't find the 12th driver. And I, I think he was, I don't know, drunk someplace. Or I, I, nobody could find him. That's what we, you, we found out later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We found that afterwards. And the vehicle was locked. The steering wheel was locked. So I said, look, the convoy's leaving at 10 o'clock. I don't have the time to sit around here and try to find him. The vehicle's my responsibility. I broke the lock. I had one of my drivers drive the vehicle. Um, and, and, and drive it back up to Fubai. And so I say in my class, the class starts at 9 o'clock, not 9.10. Otherwise, you're gonna miss the convoy. <laughs> you, you, you made your point, and they didn't show up late after that. No. <laughs> exactly. So, Lee, I wanna do everything I can to help you fill those seats in your upcoming class. I've been asking and seeking for veterans out there who if you know anyone that has a small business and they currently have their business, they want to grow their business, this is a, a great course for veterans in the Metro West area. So please reach out to us and Lee Goldberg at www.vetrn.org. And we'll make sure we'll put that out there for everybody. Thank you so much. So thank you, Lee, for being on the show with us here today and capturing your story. Um, we'd like to have you back as, as you start the class. Maybe we could do something with uh, the business owners and sharing. Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great. It'd be great having, having them share their businesses. successes. Yeah.
Right, and we're going to try to find more female veterans for you in the next course. So Great, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank, with you, us. Have, thank you for thank having you. me, Ingrid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.